Professor John Mead, Professor of the 18th and 19th century Literature and Critical Culture at the University of Warwick. He's written widely on literature, politics, and society in the Romantic period, most recently in Conversable Worlds, um, 2011, which is, um, you know, in a very short time, it's had a big impact, I think, on Romantic studies and continues to have, or and will continue to have that impact. He's currently writing a book on print culture, on popular radicalism in the 1790s, with a work entitled The Laurel of Liberty, Print, Publicity, and Radicalism in London, 1792 to 5. And he's also Principal investigator on the Leader Human Trust funded project Networks for Improvement 1760 to 1840, a project that has a real intersection with what we're trying to do in the Creative Communities Project. Um, professor John Whale is Professor of Romantic Literature and for his sins, Head of School at the School, <laughs> uh, school of English at the University of Leeds, so my boss. Um, he's the author of, among other things, Thomas de Quincey's Reluctant Autobiography. Imagination Under Pressure, 1789 to 1832, and John Keats. He's also edited or co-edited various publications beyond Romanticism, Essays on Burke's Reflections, two volumes of the works of Thomas de Quincey, and Contesting Creativity, a recent special issue of the Journal for 18th Century Studies. His work, his research currently focuses on the culture of pugilism, 1780 to 1830, and the writings and works of William Bosco of Liverpool. Um, so these are two really eminent romanticists, and I'm delighted that they've agreed to give their thoughts on today. So if we could welcome them. Uh, thank you. Actually, I'd like to start uh, as I'm uh, something of an outsider by uh, thanking um, David and John for setting up the two days. Some of you weren't there yesterday, but one of the things that was striking about yesterday was the way that some thought had been given to tr try and find a structure that wasn't just people standing up and speaking, and I was amazed, being a cynic somewhat by nature, how well um, it worked. Uh, and, and then I'd like to thank you all for coming today, and especially for the Leeds Library for their hospitality. And that leads me really to the first point um, I kind of want to make. Um, <coughs> those of you who are not academics will, may not know that um, one of the things that, are, that is felt of as a pressure by academics at the moment is the need to deliver impact. Um, impact, uh, I mean, I'm opening Pandora's box now, especially since it's been filmed. Um, um, but impact is sometimes, as I said, felt as an external pressure on us to deliver measurable outcomes in terms of what we give back to the community. Now, put uh, in those terms, it seems very benign. Sometimes people feel it's rather more utilitarian than that, and it's really designed for scientists who discover things and social scientists who deliver government policy. Nevertheless, notwithstanding some reservations in that regard, there is a kind of opportunity uh, within the idea of impact for academics, within events like this, which is especially apparent to think when you can be interested in a topic like the creation of communities in this period, whose uh, outcomes are still present in our communities. Um, so one of the things Beck's paper showed very clearly was that you know, we do live in a building that is itself the product of the creativity and the tensions within that creativity uh, that are at play in a period. And one of the things I think, uh, I'm pretty sure John and David thinks as well, that one of the outcomes of this kind of activity, and it would be worth thinking uh, about our relationship to um, these kind of cultural um, buildings, spaces, paintings and art galleries, etc., etc., that are products of some of the forces we're talking about in this period. And that means in some ways as well, thinking in more for universities to think about their locations, to think about their localities, to think about the way that what they do relates to the environment around them, the social and cultural environment, and showing people what we do and getting people involved in that regard. John, I've got three or four points. Do you want to... I mean, I think I'll, 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 I'll carry on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then, then, going on from that, uh, there are sort of conceptual and content-driven things about what uh, all the people talked about today. Um, I was very, I'm very interested um, in my own work in, in, the, in the relationship between literature or print culture and text and, and where they circulate and the place they circulate, the social life, if you think of text, and the way people got together 
to discuss text. So I'm obviously uh, very interested in work like Becky's about library uh, and book club. But also that leads us to think about the things raised, I think, in Stephen's paper about address and articulation and how text comport themselves towards their audiences and think of themselves as things that are circulated. Now, obviously, that came across very strongly, I think, in Joanna's wonderful paper. Uh, I should certainly be watching the Antiques Roadshow with an eagle eye, because if those two fire warmers come up with Anna Letitia Barbell, and Fiona Bruce says, well, there seem to be some phones on this. I don't know who they're by. You know, I'll be on the phone. Yeah, there'll be a lot of money. I'll be on the phone. But that, that's a very interesting way, you know, the physical objects that surround us, you know, there may be a local museum somewhere. You know, we don't know that, those kind of physical objects interacting with a kind of textual and print culture, the sort of thing literary historians have been interested in, I think is a fascinating thing. And um, I think Joanna's paper is, a, is an early, I, I'm going to regret this metaphor, but it's a swallow of what I think is going to be a rich summer um, of, of new work looking at this kind of thing, I think. So I'm very interested in that regard. But the, one of the things that um, entails from that is that one has to think about what did people think of their communities as being and what changes were brought by these kind of experiences in the way people experience community. I mean, Les's work had this very powerful sense of Priestley as this person who kind of drove forward on the basis of conviction, but clearly in interacting in a very complicated way with different communities. And in a way, I think it's interesting to think about what, did Priest, what was Priestley's model of what creative exchange was. There's a very strong metaphor associated with, with conversation in the 18th century, which is not the one that we usually think of as defining conversation, and others are available, but that is the collision of mind with mind. And Priestley's model for conversation exchange is one of the clash of differences. This is a, actually a metaphor that goes back to another dissenting minister, Isaac Watts. He took about two flints striking that produce a spark. And the spark is the third thing that neither of those two flints necessarily understood or knew before. Um, I thought, in your Irish paper again, that what, an idea about what community might be is clearly something in a way she's thinking about in Blake, but Blake's poems trying to, in a way, of themselves, experiments in thought. What is the idea of a community in Christ? I mean, that's, in a sense, a cliche within the Christian church. It's in the Bible. But is Blake thinking about that in a new way? I think it's evident from the unusualness of his art that he does seem to be doing something new, but it's no easy matter to think through what he thinks of as community. And in that instance as well, it's further complicated by the fact he did have a kind of mentoring relationship with this patron. Blake had relationships with various patrons, none of which were happy. What kind of community is the relationship between a patron and an artist, you know, where somebody's enabled you to do something, but they, there's a sense of obligation back? And of course, that takes me to um, Rachel's paper, where there's another in the sense of act of gifting, of giving, but it seems to be certain sorts of obligations are involved. And, and that can take me back to another larger thing which I'm interested in and I've raised in, a, I think, a couple of my questions. And that is the way that friendships locally, but also communities broadly, the questions about uh, inclusion and equality, but those kind of relationships usually mean defining yourself against somebody else, whether, as with most dissenters, in opposition to the established church, but sometimes, more subtly, the other people are excluded. You know, simply put, if you're friends with X and Y, you're probably not friends with Z, you know, that your not friendship with Z may define your friendship, you know. There are class issues there as well. I think, you know, as we heard in Becky's paper, there's a sense in which a, a manufacturing elite is, is changing through time, got tensions within itself, but it's also excluding other kinds of people. Yeah. Um, you know, the factory workers are also people who are being, coming into Leeds. What kind of role are they think? So I think in all these questions of inclusion in community, there's also a question of who's left out, who's left in, what are those relationships, and how they relate to each other, and even for all those included, are, are there hierarchies? Because community, um, again, as Rachel brought out, community may involve hierarchy. It may push away from that. Certainly Barbell's circle seems to always want to value equality within it, but other, other ideas of community do have hierarchies at their heart. So I think those conceptual issues are very much at play as well. I think they were raised very interestingly um, by all the papers. John. Okay, thanks. Um, well, like John, 
has already done. I mean, uh, I'm not going to presume to offer a, a summary of what has taken place today. Um, what I'm hoping to do is to uh, give you some sense of what I find rich and fruitful, and I hope that that might trigger uh, some kind of response in you, as, as well as uh, I think we're all interested in hearing the response that, that you've all got. So I suppose where I want to begin is with the title of this network, uh, Creative Communities, and just to allow us to focus on that for a few minutes. So I suppose my first gambit would be to say, what are we doing here? And then maybe take a sacramental aspect of that, as John has already done, which is to thank you for all being here. And thank you for Jeffrey Foster for, for the, the, uh, the opportunity, uh, privileged opportunity to enjoy this space, this very distinctive and historical space, uh, and to go beyond the usual boundaries of bringing sandwiches back into it, and drinking <laughs> coffee next to valued objects. Uh, and as I'm doing so, I think as we've been aware of both yesterday and today, um, this is being filmed. We've also got a visitor's book on the table there, which most people have signed. So one of the things that I think I want to ask us to think about is the self-reflexive nature of this event, so that we can think about those events in history that we've been attempting to talk about today and yesterday. Um, what, is, what is it that we're doing? How do we capture it? Um, so we've got the minute book over in the cabinet uh, from this library in the 18th century. We've got a book that records most of us visiting here today, and we've got a video that we're going to heavily edit to the latest. <laughs> um, and it seems to me that, that, that raises the question of what is the object of our attention? What is the object of our study? Uh, what are we? Are we a community? Are we an assembly? Is this a meeting? Which of those different and, and quite resonant, individually, resonant terms would we like to apply to us? Um, how long is this going to last? <laughs> uh, you probably already asked this. <laughs> uh, will he be repeating himself? Will we be repeating ourselves? I mean, that's something that we've heard about today, about duration and repetition. And we've heard within uh, the Christian mind, and different kinds of Christian minds that have been uh, delineated before us today, uh, the habitual act of self-consciousness, of bringing to mind uh, piety and religious duty, uh, something that can take place because uh, there is a tangible uh, experience of return, uh, it, of taking something taking place in the same place, um, something that's made sacramental by an object to which one can return, or a place to which one can return. So I think, I think that, 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 that for me is one of the major, major questions of, of this whole enterprise, is what do we mean by a community? And what do we mean by creative? What is it in this that's capturable or creative? Are they the same thing? So is the creative something that's sectionable off? Um, separatable uh, and takes different forms. I suppose within our dominantly secular version of the aesthetic, and we were talking about this yesterday, there's a tendency for us to filter out that which is pious, that which is about devotion, and to, to focus thereby on what's left behind, which is the secular or the aesthetic. Um, and in some ways, this difficulty of maintaining a community, I think, is one of the dominant narratives, the precariousness of a community. Uh, in Stephen Bygrave's paper earlier, we, we, we had a fascinating quotation from Barbold, which was about civic urbanity mingled with Christian courtesy. And I think one of our meta, met, methodological problems is that we're, we probably always have a tendency to get rid of the mingling with Christian courtesy and to focus on the civic urbanity. And then we have to guard, that's the question at the end of the last session, session uh, rightly did, we had to guard against that dangerous 
uh, presentism that we're always likely to project onto these materials and these events that we're, we're attempting to deal with. But I think just to put some other kind of examples of that before us, we've had some wonderful examples today. Um, and we had a quotation in one of the papers from Kathleen Rain about Jesus' imagination is life itself. Just to take that analogy back to the business of the assembly or the meeting or this event. Well, if, if Jesus as imagination was a sign of creativity as life itself, well, what is there that's not that? In other words, that poses that question, is there something separable, something that's definable as a product that's created? Or is all the thing in its entirety, the whole of the video, is that creative? I think it's a major, a major question. Um, and in, in, in one of the other papers, I mean, from Hannah Moore, we have religion is not on the one hand merely an opinion or a sentiment, so neither is it on the other merely an act or a performance. But it is a disposition, a habit, a temper. It is not a name, but a nature. Again, that, that kind of coextensive, um, absolute, everything that composes this experience, which again poses methodological problems. I suppose that's one of, one of the most um, instructive and stimulating moments of the day for me, uh, was in Joanna's paper, where she talked about Barbold and the object poem, uh, about the possibility of creating a circumstance. I thought that was a great phrase, of creating a circumstance. And it seemed to give me a circumstance, as we might ordinarily uh, be tempted to think of it, something of a theatrical provenance that we can get our minds around, and to think of that as having its distinctive dynamic and its distinctive temporality and, and, and its distinctive sense of presence. So creating a circumstance in the way in which she brilliantly illustrated those object poems did seems to me to be very helpful in, in reminding us of one possibility of the way in which we might think of this kind of event as having uh, an aesthetic of its own. Um, so that ju they're just some thoughts. I think uh, I will end by saying that um, such congregations, such assemblies, such meetings, uh, very often, as we can see, uh, from the history of uh, the Leeds Library, depend upon certain individuals. Um, I thank Geoffrey Forster uh, himself for allowing us the privilege of being in this space, but I'd also particularly like to thank David and also Dr. Cassio for their major contribution for both, to both yesterday's event and to today's. And thank you for being here. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the fact that we've uh, created a circumstance for you. <laughs>
how is that working as the formation of a congregation. But it, it also speaks to what you started with, with accountability. What is the accountability of the university in its community, right? The impact and so forth. And so I think we're thinking about all of those things. Um, and, and, and I'll just sort of segue to when we listened or read some of us, John Aiken's uh, address to the dissidents, to the other members of the dissenting community, he was in a, in a sense calling on them to be accountable, right? Mm -hmm. Calling on them to be accountable to an idea. What was interesting about that, and this is a transition to another word, is imagination or imagined, mm -hmm. which has often been you know, linked with communities. He was imagining in that moment a community that would in fact be accountable, would work together, would strive for a sort of similar uh, objective. And, that, and I just want to very quickly to turn to that idea of imagination, uh, if it's okay, and I, I'm sorry to be making extended comment, but when I thought about um, Joanna's wonderful paper where she brought together, in a sense, what, what uh, Stephen and, and um, Les had sort of shown us as separate, the priestly and materialist uh, sort of way of seeing things in the Barboldian, more um, spiritual or something, uh, not as materialist but your discussion of the ways of working on memory and the materialist ways of you know, inscribing sort of brought them together in a way. But the one spark that I think that hymns and prose is necessarily we have to point to is that imagination that the child is supposed to use to see the beach or the nectarine and see God in it and so on and so forth. But what that relates to also is what she's doing there in that aesthetic is imagining a community, those children growing up someday and being able to help reform the children like Thomas Denman, who was one of her students at Palgrave, who eventually writes the Reform Bill in 1832. So she's imagining always that future community. Um, but you know what it struck me was this divide between Priestley and Barbell, and come back to less, this the last thought that really has me puzzled. Could it, was it not a real trust in his own imagination that left Priestley at the end completely outside of his community of other chemists? Because there was nothing material to rely on, right? He was imagining this thing as existing. And uh, I found that, I, I'd just be interested to think about the science, the scientists, right, and the role of imagination there. Do you, want to, do you want to respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a little thing to say about that, which is to do, and this may be too narrow in one sense, which is that John and I, I think, are old enough to know, we, we were trained as romanticists, and the word imagination meant something very narrow and specialist. To do in a way with imagining what isn't, making things up, the sort of thing that would pose the arts against the sciences. But I think the only paper, for instance, but probably all the papers are signs of a, a changing idea about what the imagination may be. Interestingly, going back to what I think was an 18th century, a long 18th century idea of the imagination, and the simplest example of that is in Adam Smith. Adam Smith, you probably all know, is the author of The Wealth of Nations. From some point of view, the inventor of modern economics, but probably the, well, I, I would think this, given the discipline there, probably the greatest book he, he wrote was a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. He, he was not an economics professor originally in, in Glasgow. And that book has, has a lot about imagination in it. And it's likely that the imagination is the crucial engine of thinking of a community because it's based in, on what is the ability that allows us to see ourselves in the eyes of others? What is the, that allows us to think of ourselves as ethical beings? For him, it's, it's being able to imagine what we look like to others. It's being able to put ourselves uh, in other places. It starts you to see, instead of the imagination, I mean, what is quite a narrow, romantic idea of creativity, going out, and I think Mary's paper pushed it there when she said, is this just about the arts or is it seeing creativity and imagination as a kind of ethical thing, of thinking what it's like to be like X. Or indeed thinking, I always think of this idea in relation to mortgage payments. And William Hazlitt said, we're fundamentally not invested in ourselves because every time we make a practical decision, we have to think of another person who is ourselves. So when you think about your mortgage payments, you've got to think about where you'll be in 10 years' time. And that's fundamentally an act of imagination. You've got to think about, you know, you, you can't just make a calculation of what it is. You have to think about what may happen. Now, I don't, I don't you know, it may go too far to make mortgage payments the ultimate act of imaginative. But, but one of the things that's happened recently is that the idea of what imagination is 
And the way it's true, she was being in the everyday world. Is I think a big thing for people who work in, in the literature. I think nearly every paper has touched on that in one way or the other. I, I suppose I suppose that it's just slightly different twist on that. I mean, given that Hazlitt uh, also is very often, isn't he, as in that instance, contemplating the problem of the imagination only being struck or whatever a verb we want to use by the particular example. And what uh, Hazlitt is, is profoundly aware isn't he, of the ethical dilemma of what we really need is an imagination that can cope with the abstract because that's mm -hmm. the only way in which we can deal with whole nations or with thousands of people rather than just the individual spectacle of the suffering indigent poor. Yeah. So. But I suppose that's the, the other thing for me would be that split between, you know, even, even within the Romantics, as it were, I mean, the kind of Wordsworthian uh, concept of the primary imagination, the returning to that idea that perception is imagination which would also align us with Blake as well, uh, where it's a universal thing, uh, rather than the secondary imagination, which ain't. But what we've heard today, as in uh, Joanna's example and in Stevens, I think, with Bobble, is also the idea of imagination um, attached to a notion of the, re the repeatable, uh, being habituated to imagination. So imagination isn't a kind of revelatory gl gleam, as it were, uh, uh, an instance of revelation of Augenblick, um, where a new universe is suddenly let loose, you know. Uh, but is ordinariness, it is a kind of pious repetition of being attentive, being dutiful alongside it and with imagination. Mm -hmm. So imagination in harness with duty, repetition and habit, it seems to me, that, that's the real challenge to the high romantic aesthetic. Yeah. <laughs> my mother, my yeah. mother, yeah. 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 She, she will be right. yeah. um, But related to, to John's idea of um, you know an event or participate uh, participation in an event, um, and does it matter? Are, are they would people who watch it then be incorporated into the community we come today? Um, and this is probably an imperfect analogy, but then I was thinking back to. Um, the fact that most most of the examples with uh, primary text we've heard about today are textual print material, um, and whether any of these writers are thinking about anxieties of reception, who's going to read it, mm. whether certain groups would be excluded from the community of readers. So really, just thinking about technology, print, print culture. Um, briefly, I, lo I love the the moment in Les's paper where he says. Well, I'm writing for the centre, so if you're a member of the Anglican <laughs> Church, it doesn't be, you know, he's, he's trying to dismiss one, one community of readers, but whether any of the other figures we've discussed today have uh, articulate those kind of concerns in an explicit way. Well, I suppose, um, just as a, one way I just wanted to say that the, sometimes it can be very easy to, to just to move from an idea of dissemination to an idea of community. Mm -hmm. Without thinking about the gap between those two things. So simply by disseminating an idea or a text or, or an object um, in various mediated forms, it somehow that's, that's sort of forming some sort of coherent whole. Um, and I suppose one version of that might be Benedict Anderson's argument about newspapers. That, and I think, unlike I think it's my work, I'm not always very I should be more conscious of the fact that, that dissemination doesn't equal community necessarily, and that, as you say, um, the limits of, of forms of dissemination um, are often very powerful. And I think one of the sort of fantasies of, of the internet is that suddenly everything's available to mm -hmm. everyone, and of course it's not at all for all kinds of technological reasons, and just because of the sheer amount of stuff out there. So if, if that's if that was just what your your point sparked. Sorry, John, did you want to? Um, I suppose I just want to come back to Priestley, really, um, as, uh, as, as we must, as we must, <laughs> yeah, as we, as we hope for. Um, and the extent to which, I'm mean, just going back to some of the things uh, we talked about yesterday as well, where quite, quite a lot of the historiography of, of, of communities um, of the kind that we've been looking at today in this period 
um, focus on, as they would, forms of politeness and sociability, uh, of the fact that when people come together, however dangerously and precariously and temporarily, nevertheless, um, there are opportunities for a kind of um, urbanity, I mean, going back to the, the phrase that Stephen used, civic urbanity. Um, and it's a question of how long people can hold on to that. And I suppose in the case of Priestley, I'm wondering was, fantastic though he was, um, whether here was a guy also who, um, this might be very unfair, but just, just to pose it as, 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 as uh, a kite, as it were, I mean, to say, here was a guy who wasn't great at maintaining civic urbanity. Now that might be unfair in terms of the enemies that he might produce, but um, to what extent is it possible, given, given, the, discover rousing, <laughs> <laughs> given, given the discoveries of science, is it possible to present those in a way that's less, shall we say, irascible or less provocative? I mean, I, I mean I, I'm thinking here of your, you know, the, your fantastic example where he appeals to the Anglicans in that, that kind of rhetorical tour de force, which you know, has, raises questions that Stephen thought was very importantly doing about rhetoric, about how you address uh, other people, how you address the others, as it were, or those, your, as you would put it, your foes. Um, that little turn, is that going to incense them more? I think it is. I just make the point that all new scientific discoveries yeah. are by their very nature controversial mm -hmm. uh, and they offend people. <coughs> uh, in the very early days of science, they offended religion. Yeah, yeah. Even to this day, dare I say I'm involved in one myself right now, would you be mentioned a little <laughs> in connection? <laughs> and yeah. uh, there's a saying that if you come up with a new idea in science, you have to wait for your... Um, the, we call them peer peers or, or contemporaries, mm -hmm. to die and also for the students to die mm -hmm. before <laughs> these ideas get recognised. And Priestley was up against that his whole life. Mm -hmm. um, but it, well, I mean, yeah, I suppose there are, we didn't talk about this, but, I mean, necessarily you had a biographical drive, but he was involved in various, I mean, he was, in, there's a, he was involved in that chemistry society in yeah, London. Yeah, the Lunar Society, that was a uh, in And in, in London as well, that yeah. chemistry coffee house. <coughs> yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So, although they did, can, I mean, it's also, I think your point about precariousness is interesting because people, they participate, whether they can be sustained through time, mm. partly it's because he is pushed to different places by circumstance. He does seem to often gather a group and then push yeah, on. But to, to, to answer your question, I would need a better definition of the term civic urbanity. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. have problems with that. <laughs> well, what, one thing though, has been <laughs> when you've been talking about that, it's been on the edge of my mind. There was a very interesting article uh, recently. I think it was, I can't remember if it's in the TLS or the, uh, the THES or the, or the Guardian, which was about the fact that there's a push to put everything on the internet, lectures, everything. Mm -hmm. And what was being talked about is, well, what's left for a university? Mm. Yeah. And this was a long, rather doleful article. And at the end it said, the city. What? <laughs> you know, that, that's what it said. I mean, if you're at somewhere like Leeds, uh, which I'm not, but it's, it's, a, it's a very fortunate circumstance. You know, what you do have, however many of your lectures are online and people are listening to them in Nova Scotia or wherever, you will still be in Leeds. So the and question, this, the, the new IT revolution, do we need buildings? Do we need communities? Mm -hmm. No. Well, I, I agree with you. I mean, I've, I've, I've plucked out civic urbanity from, from that quotation because it strikes me that it is strained. It is, you know, do you need civic and urbanity? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if it was a student essay, you might say, do you want, well, I'll have one or the other. <laughs> uh, you know, either you're civic or you're urbane, do, do you want yeah. civic urbanity? And it seems to me that's what's interesting about it. It's that moment where Barbold is, is having to stretch, and then she wants mingled with Christian courtesy, as if courtesy is another term with Christianity that you want to, you want to place alongside it. So it seems to me... I mean, you know, her text is under, under stress at that point, and, it, and it's revealing some of the nature of that stress, of a secular, uh, a secular thrust, as it were, with a pious one, having to work together in the constraints of that kind of assembly. Well, I, th 
think Christian courtesy, I wouldn't have a problem with courtesy, is a Christian value. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. um, mm. And, uh, and um, I think Blake might disagree with you there. Well, I think Priestley was the epitome of Christian courtesy. Uh, he was extremely annoyed and, and rattled, but he never, he, yeah. except in, in writing, but he never, he yeah. never lost his temper. Yeah. He never advocated any kind of violence. Mm -hmm. He was. Um, so he honestly was, never loses temper. Never. No. No. He wasn't the bad nucleus. He was portrayed as as, as yeah. this revolutionary traitor, yeah. but it's all completely false. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I say that with a dis I mean, because I do think one of the things that comes across, <coughs> I mean, one of the reasons there's a tension for me is the, the civic urbanity. Although, even though uh, etymologically one comes from the other, in a sense, what's the what urbane has come to mean is a kind of smooth politeness mm -hmm. yes. whereas what we're often seeing as civic values well that's collision of mind with mind yeah. that's why yeah. Priestley seemed to have gone to London coffee houses that's why Godwin seemed to have enjoyed literary London it was often a kind of clash of opinions yeah. mm -hmm. which is evolved in a certain sort of urban space mm -hmm. that's I mean this and it's interesting to to have kind of word maps where things overlap but over tensions with where what's valued as conviviality yeah. And conviviality is often intention with politeness, because conviviality mm -hmm. suggests you might knock over your pine. Yeah. Yeah. I like the word smoothness. You do. Yeah. Well, the, the, other, the other one there is, yeah. is cosmopolitanism, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You know, of, of kind of certain levels of circulation uh, that involve some kind of meta level of politeness, mm -hmm. that, as opposed to the embeddedness that might be there and the particularity and regionality yeah. that might be there in conv mere conviviality, as it were. Yeah. John, you, you said... Um, Which John? <laughs> said the, one with, the one with that one, yeah. <laughs> no, you, this one. Um, about um, Blake yeah. um, not showing Christian courtesy. But the nature... Um, well, what Levi said about yeah. uh, Blake was that he wrote as he did and he became as esoteric and bizarre as he did mm -hmm. because he had no sense of belonging to any community that mm -hmm. that he he didn't reckon that he had readers and so he never had the discipline mm -hmm. of writing with a readership mm -hmm. in mind mm -hmm. and um you know i was i was interested in in what naomi had to say because she was finding some kind of notion of community in blake mm -hmm. that had nothing to do with his being in any kind of social relationships at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he did. The pro I mean, I w I'm not sure I'd go to Levis for my information on Blake, uh, but, but I mean, he, one thing Levis completely doesn't think about is the fact that Naomi mentioned at the beginning that all those, those paintings are made with a very specific reader in mind, the person who paid for them to be painted, which is mm -hmm. Thomas Butts. So that's one circumstance. It may lead you further down your chat. John and I were talking here, and John was pointing out that it's, I mean, in some ways, this, this has become a hermeneutic that people go to as their first move, and perhaps it's not always right, but it's certainly the case, is often seen as being in some way parodic, i.e., I've got to produce these paintings for you, I kind of know you're more or less orthodoxly Christian, I'm not entirely comfortable for that, but I need, I need the job, and so there's been a lot of, look, what are the tensions, what sort of tensions does that produce in the painting, which often seem to kind of inhabit a kind of orthodox iconography, but the more you look at them, don't seem very um, orthodox. Um, so, and it, the question then, I mean, Levis had a very strong idea about what, you know, that there was an authentic tradition that constitutes community, but it's possible to think of lots of other community Blake might have wished to be involved in. Well, it was the notion of the discipline of feeling you had a readership. Yeah, but that very quickly becomes a particular kind of discipline in Lewis, doesn't it? That's his great tradition, that's the only thing that, that counts. I'm not, I mean, my point is I think Blake did, have, did know he had various readerships, however small they were. Um, increasingly work on Blake's been about who did, he, who did he make those books for? You can actually find that they were, by and large, commissioned. Or even if they weren't commissioned, he had a stock of um, printed versions of individual pages that he banned in a particular way for a reader. So it's actually turning out mm -hmm. nearly everything he did, much more actually than a conventional published book, where you may know you have a readership in the abstract, but you may never know your reader. Blake nearly always knew who his reader was, in a very specific kind of way. He could tell you their name. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, John, you'll know 
about this much more than I do, John, but isn't, isn't there a sense in which one of the interesting things about Blake is that he's, he's sort of on the, the fringes of, 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 of several sort of religious sort of sects or communities in, in, in London, and he's, it's the fact that he's on the fringes of those communities that's interesting because he's sort of reacting to them and, and responding to them. So he, he's, in a sense, he, he, he's, he's perhaps quite, quite conscious in some texts of the communities that he's not, not part of. But does that in some way make him part of them, if you see what I'm thinking yeah. of most of the Swedenbergians and Magic Heaven and Hell and all that stuff? But there is, I think, even when writers are sort of, or, or artists are imagining themselves as individualistic, um, even a negative response to a community could be seen as communal in some yeah. respects, I suppose. It's my, my sort of rather crude point. I, I, think the word, I think the word courtesy itself is a kind of problematic one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would more readily associate it with uh, forms, mediated forms of chivalry. Yeah, well, the, I mean, the rather other thing than Christ, yeah. simply Christianity. And there's also a very strong evangelical critique of politeness by the late 18th century, which bizarrely some rationalists like Priestley and Godwin also talk about, whereas politeness is associated with untruth. Mm. I, I really, you know, even, so the classic case is evangelicals is that it's bad form, even among Anglicans believers to talk about religion at the dinner table, whereas Moore, and especially Wilberforce, thought that was a form of hypocrisy, but that was politeness equals hypocrisy. Wilberforce, I've now chopped this out about six times over the last <laughs> two days, but Wilberforce used to make lists of what he called launches before he went to dinner somewhere. These were ways of bringing the conversation back around to talking about God, whereas most forms of politeness would regard that as an awkward thing yeah. if you start talking about your faith. But similarly, some rationalists like Godwin also felt that politeness was a way of cloaking the collision of mind with mind, a way of cloaking getting at the truth, yeah. that politeness is a way of avoiding talking yeah, about what yeah. we really ought to talk about. And that yeah. critique emerges very strongly yeah, in that. Like, like, you know, like Falkland and Caleb yeah, Williams, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, that, that false form of chivalry is, yeah. is, a, is a deceitful masking yeah. of the truth, isn't it? But I mean, the, 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 going back to Stephen Bygraves' uh, paper, I mean, I mean, I think I mentioned it in question, it's been, creative community, but quite a lot of what those communities themselves were interested in were, you know, to use Steve's combination of terms, conviction or truth. Mm. And, th th and, and in some ways, I think, by predisposing what we're doing to creative community, we immediately are tempted to put a squeeze on conviction and truth, aren't we, in mm. a way? We're bound to. Uh, but I just wonder what people in this meeting think about creativity as a as a term, I mean, how useful a term is that? I mean, in other words, rather than describing, as I was attempting to do in my few words of, of, uh, of response, of activity is a very different thing, or process is a very different thing from creativity as such. Creativity predisposes us to think perhaps in certain delimited aesthetic terms. I can see some interesting faces around here. <laughs> Who's gone there? <laughs> yes, you. <laughs> yeah. um, I was just thinking it's a way of bridging a, a very modern and perhaps now what's so anachronistic gap between art and science. Like, previously, it's certainly creative. Mm. Um, and thinking about, you know, other other figures who you would now think of as scientists like Humphrey Davy or Tom Fettis, they're also, I think, mm. they find the imagination is absolutely crucial. So, I think they, they would see their activity as, as creative. So yes, I agree that it shuts off certain things, but it enables connections. The term creativity has got sort of three major kinds of meanings. One is the sort of thing that's tested by creativity tests, mm. um, and uh, as it's best in, seen in problem solving. Um, then secondly, there's the sort of therapeutic notion of creativity um, which results in more people writing poetry than reading poetry these days as one, as one aspect of it and thirdly there's the artistic mm. kind which is a sort of pale imitation of um, God's creativity creating something out of nothing that is valuable um, you know I don't know which of these 
creative communities is going to deal with, but certainly uh, one can see very clearly how the therapeutic notion of its being emotionally healthy to belong to a community would apply, but how the problem solving, yes, people come together in associations to deal with, with problems, but whether the artistic creativity side is in, you know, how that would apply in a phrase like creative communities, I'm not entirely sure, except insofar as um, you do see these communities existing, for example, among uh, groups of painters coming together. Um, so you know, but there, there are at least three, three different aspects to look at when you're talking about creative communities. Mm. I'm going yeah. to, sorry, I, I mean, I think that's a really, really helpful response. I'm going to allow one more question of opportunity to wind up, and as Scott has definitely travelled the furthest to be part of this community. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, no, actually, David, I was wondering if it might be valuable as we're sitting here, and we do have members outside of our academic community, if we should invite them, and no pressure, but to, to, to tell us sort of what they saw here or what, you know, how well we did or you know what this sort of meant or what was their value. Yeah, yeah. Um, because well, I would love to hear from some of those voices. One of the things that we will do after, after this event is we will be contacting by email all the people who, who were on the list, um, both academics and non-academics, and uh, soliciting in a, in a non sort of pressurizing way yeah. responses <laughs> because and it's not a sort of just a that isn't just sort of a reflex bit of politeness or courtesy, it's something we're genuinely interested in. Responses from everybody who was here, um, people who, who, who perhaps not everybody had the chance to ask questions or make comments. So um, they can be responses about the events in itself, or they can be responses about the content of the yeah. event, but we really would be very keen to get that, and we will send out an email to that effect. Um, we better finish there. Thanks very much for your attendance, and thanks so much to the speakers and to Jeff at the Leeds Library and his staff. Thanks a lot.